Hi, I'm Meta Spencer. Uh, today, I don't know whether you want to go to NATO or not, but if you are in favor of NATO, you might find this interesting. Uh, we're not going to Brussels, but we're going to Alabama or someplace where a NATO official is prowling around trying to promote his solution to the world's problems. His name is John Manza, and he is, as I've been told, uh, the Assistant Secretary General for Operations for NATO. And uh, obviously, they've just been having a NATO meeting. I don't know if it's over yet, but they certainly have been planning things for our future. Uh, we also have uh, three other uh, guests who are going to interact with John Manza. Um, I, Erica Simpson, I will announce first, I wanted her to introduce the others, but she says she's not ready to do that. Oh, no, I can do it, man. I don't mind. Right. Okay. I, I, no, I said it took me a minute, but I can, I can certainly introduce them. Do you want me to introduce? I'll introduce yeah, tell me, Fred. tell us who Ed, uh, Frederick Pearson is, and I, we will hope that Alvin Saperstein shows up, but he may have forgotten this today. I just want to mention, um, Ameta, that uh, Dr. Manza is the former assistant because now he's a professor at the National Defense University. So I'm not sure why he's traveling around to Alabama, but it's not on behalf of NATO, right, John? So thanks so much for helping to orchestrate this event, Erica. It's really great that you know these people who have the kind of contacts that you are making. You just corrected my big blooper because I'm I got sure. my information from Google. And of course, yeah. you, Google is always way out of date. So I'm sorry, John. So John Manza is actually a professor at the National Defense University in North Oak, Virginia. Uh, Alvin Saperstein is a professor emeritus of physics at Wayne State University, and he has spent time as a researcher at the Peace Research Institute in Oslo. Why don't I introduce, uh, why don't I introduce Erica and Erica introduce me. <laughs> <laughs> er, I don't need much introduction for Erica because she's here so often. She's an associate professor of political science at Western University in London, Ontario, and her special bag is NATO, which is why we're... Not really, but it is sort of. I don't I feel like it's so. bag, but it's okay. You like it that I talk about it. You want, I, I want you to be a specialist in NATO, so do, do okay. so for the interim. All right, Frederick Pearson, uh, who was going to introduce uh, Erica before I jumped on it. Uh, is a professor of political science and a former director of the Center for Peace and Conflict Studies at Wayne State University. Is that right? That is right. Good. Anything you want to add to that, anybody? Well, a lot of my work does deals with international military intervention and arms transfers. And Erica and I have been writing quite a bit lately about um, nuclear policy in Europe. And also provocative uh, force postures. The occasion uh, for uh, which makes it a bit timely for us now is that NATO has just been having their big annual, or maybe it's more than annual nowadays, uh, meeting a sort of summit. And um, uh, I, I hear that some things have been announced that I wasn't uh, completely up on yet. Maybe Frederick, you can uh, begin by telling us what. It was the before, news of the day yesterday uh, out of talks. Brussels. Uh, before Ed talks, you've gone through introductions and I came in a little late. Can you tell me who Meta is? Oh, Meta Spencer <laughs> is a retired sociology professor, University of Toronto, and the editor of Peace Magazine and et cetera, Project Save the World. Okay, thank you. And I would have added, if I introduced Erica, that she's president. I don't know if she's still president, but has been president of the Canadian Re Peace Research Association. That's right. That's a huge responsibility. I'm still president. But, you know, I, I just want to mention that I redid Meta's uh, CV, academic CV. I think it's 100, it's 67 pages long. Most of it is publications. She's well, it's probably a large font. <laughs> bring her tons of money. She's, if you don't mind me saying, 90 years old, incredibly accomplished. She's going to get the Order of Canada soon. And she does. Come on. Said, How many of these interviews have you done? 405. I'm not. 
You've done four, well, yeah, whatever we have, we're applying. So but the main <laughs> point is she's done 405 or 450 of these since COVID started, which means one pretty well every day. And so it's hard to get all these people together and it's hard to go through their biographies and so on. But anyway, I'm happy to see that we have such an accomplished uh, panel. And I understand, Meta, that we're, you're going to ask us questions and also the audience is going to ask us live questions. Is that right? Well, uh, the audience always can if they're, yeah. you know, while it's live. And what they do is type in a question and Adam will, if he thinks it's a juicy question, Adam, my assistant will enter, you know, come in and ask the question. But it, this rarely happens. So don't count on it. It's not likely. Uh, most of our audience watches us after I've edited this show and put it onto YouTube and a whole bunch of other places, our, our website to save the world.ca and a number of social, uh, social media platforms. Anyway, thank you so much uh, for uh, your generous uh, words. I don't usually uh, say anything except this is Meta Spencer because I I'm here too often. Thank you. All right. All of you are, I'm delighted to see you and, um, Let's get down to work. Did you I want me to like, start off with those comments, Meta? Yes, please, please right. tell us what uh, has been. Uh, and this is all very conversational. You can interrupt well, each other and yeah. and even yell at each other if you want. Well, I started off to, for today uh, to, to respond to John Manza's article a while back, a little while back in, in relation to the Ukraine war, where he was warning that the Russians could, if pressed hard enough, this is a time that they were losing in the war, or not losing, but uh, hard pressed to accomplish anything in the war fair, that they might resort to the nuclear options for um, um, tactical nuclear weapons. And Putin, of course, has rattled those sabers notoriously. And I think John and I also agree that since that time, uh, the Russians have uh, quote unquote done better in their, uh, in their strange uh, 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 aims, and probably are not quite as near to that uh, threshold as they might have been. And even then they may not have been very near it because it can lead down the slippery slope of nuclear war with the West. The problem though, as I see it, is that the current development that's just taking place in, fr in our very, uh, front of our very eyes in NATO's meeting th this week is enlargement of NATO. And uh, it's perfectly understandable. And Putin deserves it because he stupidly blundered into this mess where he has done what he presumably didn't want to do, which is strengthen NATO, uh, as opposed to weakening it, uh, with the uh, likely admission of Sweden and uh, Finland. And who would have thought that Finland would actually come away from neutrality to actually join NATO? That's a pretty dire situation. But if you look at this geographically and strategically, there is a concern. There's a downside to this because, yes, NATO is strengthened and the U.S. is putting in a lot more troops on into Europe, uh, Biden has announced, that's something like, is it 300,000 uh, to be based in Europe? and particularly um, moving into Poland with a uh, permanent installation there, uh, command installation. And Romania. Uh, and Romania. And the view from Moscow of this has to be uh, um, problematic in the sense that the NATO now has the capability of completely flanking the Russians to the north and to the south. And Turkey's back aboard, evidently uh, proving for some kind of a trade-off, the admission of the new states. It hasn't been voted on yet by the 30 parliaments, shall we say, but it's in the offing. And any time in history that I've observed where one side or the other feels uh, conventionally disadvantaged yeah. in their confrontation, that's when they became enamored with the potential of tactical nuclear weapons. It happened with the United States for a period of time when we perceived a severe disadvantage with Russian artillery and tanks in the Cold War era. And we refused to make a no first use nuclear pledge because it appeared that there might be nuclear options to offset the Russians' uh, advantages. Mm -hmm. In the Cuban Missile Crisis, where Khrushchev was at a distinct conventional disadvantage in the Caribbean, 
with no, no, no major Navy. He had actually pre-authorized Russian troops in Cuba to use tactical nuclear weapons. The U.S. didn't have a clue about this, merged later, if the U.S. had invaded Cuba with Marines, which was on the table for the Kennedy, uh, you know, XCOM decision makers, one of their options. They would have blundered into a nuclear, potentially a nuclear reception in Cuba. Even then, when the U.S. didn't do that, we put a naval blockade around, calling it a quarantine. Interesting in light of the pandemic today. Um, the Russians came close to using nuclear uh, tactical uh, uh, sea-based uh, uh, weapon in a submarine that, they, that the uh, captain was ready to launch, evidently, only to be stopped by the admiral mm -hmm. uh, when he found out about it. So we came closer than we thought to a nuclear uh, trigger. Mm -hmm. And in a way, what NATO has done with Putin is that if he sees himself as such a disadvantage, potentially going forward, and he's interested in Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, the former Russian Soviet republics, etc., cetera, um, he has already rattled nuclear sabers. He could conceivably see these tactical weapons as a, as a fearsome deterrent to NATO starting anything or NATO pushing too hard. And the, de the determination of what, what that all means in a crisis situation is very uncertain. Misperception, accidental uh, moves. Uh, you know, we started this when we almost interpreted a flight of geese in the 1950s as a Russian, bomb as a, as a Russian bomber force coming into the US with our NORAD radars. Uh, there's a lot of room for misjudgment and misunderstanding and misperception. And the closer you come to a hair trigger for nuclear weapons, even at tactical level, the worse it is. And I'm afraid I would say in regard to Dr. Saperstein, the nuclear scientist, that the old the nuclear clock, uh, in a way, with NATO expanding, probably has come maybe five minutes closer to midnight um, in Putin's kinds of er errat uh, erratic decision making. Can't come That's the point I would make. I think it's only three minutes to the midnight right now. We can't come five minutes more. <laughs> I don't even. It's two minutes. Like, it's like even less than than that. Every every yeah. day, or rather, it, it, it inches upward. But uh, John's right. They're not likely to do it as long as they perceive they're winning, quote unquote, in Ukraine. But that's uncertain for how that's going to turn out, and uh, how they'll perceive this newly. Um, in, 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 in large NATO. You know, uh, a month or so ago, or maybe it was two by now, uh, we have a, a global town hall every month, the last Sunday of every month. And there are two people who usually turn up. One is in Moscow and the other is a peace worker in Kiev. And the Kiev guy said, look, can you help us somehow get a message to Xi and to Modi? because those are probably the only two people who could yank on Putin's chain and tell him, absolutely, don't you dare use a nuclear weapon. Of course, how could we reach these guys? But do you think that would actually be a realistic um, effort, uh, a, a method of trying to constrain him? John, you look as if you might answer the question. <laughs> Um, I don't know uh, how much influence she or Modi has on um, on Putin at this at this point. Um, Who's going to restrain Modi when probably, he gets into it with Pakistan? Yeah, um, she I think probably has more leverage on Putin right now because. Uh, China is providing an economic outlet to Russia uh, that helps Russia avoid the sanctions uh, that have been imposed on, on Putin's regime. So they, they certainly have leverage. Um, but is, you know, I think one of the factors that Fred just brought up is, is nobody really knows uh, what are the levers that work with Putin? And where is the red line that would cause him to potentially use uh, a tactical 
nuclear nuclear weapon. So sure, I mean, we could we could have diplomatic engagements. We should be using all the different elements of power uh, to to try to solve this this crisis and 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 de-escalate. Um, but it's hard when you're dealing with an actor like Putin who doesn't respond well to our normal Western way of uh, of dealing with with foreign leaders. And Erica has written well about the need to rejuvenate the discussions for strategic controls in Europe, the escalation. But that's very hard in the midst of a war in Ukraine. It's not me that's saying that. It's saying, uh, that the international uh, NGOs and the community are looking to the OSCE, which is, has really very low funding. And then they're asking for new start to be somehow jigged. But obviously, we're in the middle of a crisis. So nobody is expecting that there will be bilateral or even multilateral arms control negotiations. Nobody, I mean, I was hopeful that the NPT review conference in August would reach, would go somewhere. But from everything that I'm seeing, including the very few members of civil society showing up, I don't think we're going to see any movement on arms control for a very long time, but that doesn't mean you can't write about the necessity to have, as John Maz is saying, dialogue in all sorts of multilateral organizations. We can't give up on trying to talk even with uh, recalcitrant states like Saudi Arabia and Iran and North Korea. You don't stop talking when you're getting a divorce. You still have to have a mediator and so on. I speak from experience. I think the experience of the Minsk agreement, which was aborted, unfortunately, leading to all of this mess, uh, means that the OSCE and the NATO Russia Council, I believe, are crucial to be looked at for renewed negotiations. And so yeah, although uh, you're, I think you're too quick to blame the Minsk failure just because the OSCE was not able to agree. Just because of one failure doesn't mean you throw the baby out no, with the water. Right. You know what I'm saying? So the OSC can still be effective. It's got. I'd like five. to see the Minsk Agreement rejuvenated, brought back in some workable way. Yeah. Because to me, Something. that's the only way out of this. What would have to change in order to be it workable? At, at this moment, you know, it's hard to imagine. Well, you'd have to do something about the Donbass's future. That satisfied both sides, and it would take very creative diplomacy. Which would I you have to even touch the Crimea question? Could possibly you, could not. Could you bracket that? I think Zelensky has sort of conceded that what you could do is he would deal with the other issues and kind of bracket the 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 Crimea question for later uh, later work, which you know is like building in a guaranteed frozen conflict. But, what, but what's wrong with that, Meta? What's wrong with a frozen conflict? We have that everywhere. We have it in Cyprus. Well, that's true. We that's North true. and South Korea. Just put a, another central front. I just am concerned that the air defense for uh, NATO against Eastern Ukraine is going to be immense effort. So I don't, incredibly costly. 300,000 troops along the eastern flank for NATO for the next 20 years. Well, you pay for that. Um, that's going to be very, very expensive. There, so, there's not 300,000 troops on NATO's 30, eastern flank. No, no. I well, think Stoltenberg said today 30 to 300,000. Right? Yes, but right? they're not going to the eastern flank. I've yeah, got to make sure this gets out clear. Yeah. Um, response force for several years has been 30,000 troops. That doesn't mean those 30,000 troops are sitting on the eastern flank. Most of them are sitting in their home nations, including Canada. They're not deployed. Now, in response to the invasion of Ukraine, most of those 30,000 troops are deployed along uh, NATO's eastern but when they increase the NATO response force from 30 to 300,000, um, that is a force that is, you know, primarily in reserve. Some of them might, might go forward, but, but that would be almost a full mobilization of NATO's resources. Nobody's talking about that right now. This is just like the United States as we have 
quick reaction forces, Marines and and Army forces that are sitting at Fort Bragg or Camp Lejeune, just because you organize them into a, a, a tactical or optional organization doesn't mean they're deployed. So it isn't really going to multiply the cost by 150%. Yeah. No, it's like a UN rapid reaction capability. They would be deployed, but they uh, would the train console? together, and they would be they would you would have to station them, well, and you'd have to be ready, and that's going to cost a lot of money, isn't it? This is, this is absolutely not correct. This does not mean they are stationed anywhere. Canada will have elements of that three hundred thousand force. They will stay in Canada. They might occasionally go forward for exercises. But this does not mean they will be stationed in Europe. Those forces are ready to go forward in a time of crisis. So, you know, the manning, uh, the troop levels will have to be higher. Their equipment readiness will have to be ready. They'll be better trained, perhaps, than, than would most conventional forces. Let me ask um, a, more, a couple of more general questions. One is... A, why the Minsk thing failed. I don't, I don't think it's usually useful to go back and try to cast blame on, on people, but it, at least I think there is a real question of why it failed. And, and the even bigger question is, you know, should uh, NATO have uh, continued its uh, move to the east? How much blame should uh, be uh, apportioned to NATO for or the people running it uh, for continuing to expand and to what extent does Putin have a legitimate grievance? Uh, certainly there's no, nobody I think would argue that it's a good enough grievance to excuse what he did, but those are two real questions that everybody talks about. And I expect you guys have strong opinions about it. Well, I think that politics can't be ignored in our calculations and we have to keep it in mind. We failed to do that in Afghanistan, for instance. NATO's involvement, U.S. involvement. We didn't understand the country. We, we tried to remake it in an image that we had for it. It completely, completely failed. There is a fine uh, uh, oral history out now, sort of like the Pentagon Papers about Afghanistan that we should, you should take a look at uh, to see how much misjudgment there was about what could be done with that country. Well, of course, Europe is not Afghanistan and is much more uh, developed, uh, de developed in terms of governmental structures. But uh, you can't ignore the politics of, uh, of a situation. And I think that there's a tendency, maybe even in the, with Joe Biden uh, and uh, his crew of people that he's come up with through his, his, uh, his political career, to overdo things a little bit at times. And certainly, of course, the Republicans did it in Afghanistan, as, uh, certainly and in Iraq. But uh, Biden's people, and I include the Obama administration at that time, um, did a little bit too much uh, you know, pushing in places like Libya. And um, um, even maybe you could argue in Kosovo, uh, others did that pushing too. Uh, to stand up for these so-called principles, which are important principles like Putin has violated so many principles of international law and the, uh, the global order, rules-based global order. But you got to be careful not to go too far in pushing back because you create chaos and you create um, um, uh, confrontations that probably are needlessly escalated. So I'm, I'm a little bit worried about too much uh, pushback on the Russians in a way that ignores their interest that Meta might have been talking about. Poland is extremely on the radar of Russia. Cannot ignore the history, Germany and Russia for Poland. And but you, while can't, you can't really say that, that Russia fears Poland. Well, they fear it Poland has to be being vice taken versa. into the sphere of hostility. I mean, let's, let's remember, this was the Warsaw Pact. All of these Eastern countries that are now NATO was the Warsaw Pact. Putin is trying to recreate that, that empire, so to speak. That was given to them, if you will, if you read Winston Churchill's memoir, when he sat in a room with Stalin 
and they had pieces of paper with each Eastern European country on it with ratios, 50-50, 60-40, 90-10, 80-20. All those 80-20s and 90-10s were for Soviets to get control of Romania uh, and, uh, um, uh, you know, Hungary and many of these Eastern European provinces. What what Britain got was Greece. Greece would be uh, 80-20 Britain. And Stalin kept to that agreement, by the way. He didn't even support the Greek communists in the Civil War. It was Tito who supported them. We didn't understand that. But Churchill made this deal with Stalin to give away Eastern Europe because the Red Army was there and and the West wasn't. And he figured he had had to come up with Greece. This was before Roosevelt arrived. I think the meeting might have even been at Yalta, if I'm remembering correctly. Oh, so Roosevelt wasn't in on the the negotiations? No, he hadn't arrived yet. Uh They sat alone in a room, these two guys who hated each other's guts, Churchill and Stalin. And they did the pieces of paper. And when they were done with it, uh, Stalin pushed them uh, back to Ch- Churchill. And, um, and Churchill said, well, what should I do with these? Should we burn them? They're a little embarrassing. Should we burn them? These pieces of paper, Stalin said, no, you keep them. You keep them because this is a deal and you have me on paper uh, as the agreement. So this is where Russians come from in their historical memory, uh, for better or worse. Tyrants, yes. But uh, for better or worse, the historical memory of what is Russia and who do they dominate or who shouldn't you know, they that's a, dominate. The better story than I'd ever heard before. Certainly, yeah, we Churchill all hear about memoirs. How, how Yalta was you know, given away. But it, it sounds uh, quite surprising that Churchill would be the one who would be so uh, generous in, in that context. I mean, that's not his character. I mean, if you can believe him, he, he gave the story. And by the way, then two years later, he comes to Independence, Missouri, to Fulton, Missouri, sorry, Fulton, Missouri, and gives the Iron Curtain speech. Yeah. Can you think of greater chutzpah than that? You've just given away yeah. and agreed. And then you come to Missouri under Truman and you say how terrible it is that you got an Iron Curtain. When you say gave it away, did he really have a choice? He didn't have a choice. The, the, the American army hadn't even reached Berlin. I mean, let's face it, politics is politics, but military, military. And in the final analysis, a gun in your hand is better than a piece of paper. Can I ask uh, John Manz a question? Because I did read that um, Vice President Joe Biden met with Angela Merkel around the Minsk Accords, and she gave him wise advice that he supposedly ignored. And I'm just wondering if you heard anything about that, like of, of Merkel giving um, President Biden advice that was ignored. Because that's About the Minsk said. agreement, is that Eric? Yeah, about the Minsk agreement, because we, it's too early for us to know what happened there, but clearly she was, did you hear anything about that? Because you were in the Pentagon and in, you were in Washington around that time. Uh, actually, I'm, um, I'm not familiar with that, but I, I, I would, if somebody answers that question, like to go back to Meta's point about um, the enlargement of NATO and the risks with Russia. And did anybody bring this up at the time? And it brought up the risks of expansion when they went from 16 to 19. Uh, and then again, lots of liberals have brought it up and also at NATO. Count- I was even at the NATO Council in 2000 and um, right after 9-11, and they were talking about the risks of expansion. And I remember Nicholas Burns shot down this young liberal academic who said, oh, well, there was some problems with expansion. Um, at the time, it seemed perfectly reasonable. And people like me who wrote against expansion um, we, did, we were persona non grata. We were not paid any attention to put up your hand and try and say that argument. They wanted NATO expansion. So to, hindsight is 50-50. You can't always argue in, now that we shouldn't have expanded. At the time, it seemed to make sense amongst the liberals and even hawkish uh, conservatives. Well, but, you know, Mearsheimer famously said this was a mistake. Mm-hmm. Kennan, who wrote the Cold War doctrine of containment. He thought it was a mistake at the time. So I I just wanted to respond to Meta's point that there were folks who who thought this was too provocative. 
uh, in the face of Russia, who understood how they would view it um, and went along with it anyway. I mean, what's difficult, two points I would make on this is one, the Washington Treaty says that there's an open door, that if there are democracies in the North Atlantic region who um, are qualified to join the alliance, we will welcome them. And the second point is every nation in that alliance welcome, you know, they have to have consensus. It's actually the only place in the Washington Treaty where consensus is mentioned. So every nation, including Canada, uh, agreed to uh, bringing in each of these members. And I think they probably will soon for Sweden and Finland. But it's a, it's a uh, case where, you know, there's the ideal of the Washington Treaty and protecting democracies in Europe. And then the reality, the real politic of what does this mean from the Russian perspective? And John, it's interesting that the treaty doesn't give you an exit strategy to kick somebody out who's no longer democratic. And I can, That's think, of a, I can think of a couple of candidates there. Uh-huh, uh, like Hungary. <laughs> uh-huh. Turkey, Turkey well, is. Well, actually, <laughs> Poland has its little foibles too, with <laughs> their government. But okay, but they're doing such good things in terms of taking in the Ukrainians that you have to be pretty forgiving. Anyway, I'm sorry. I shouldn't intervene so much. No, it's fine. But I remember NATO didn't do any studies. Like I went through the NATO library because I was really against expansion and I did write about it. And there were no NATO fellows that were arguing against it. Nobody did the costs of expansion uh, and, and how it was, it was, you know, billions of dollars. So the whole raison d'etre, the whole time that we were, went through was for NATO expansion and to now say that it was wrong is foolish. And so I think what we that started on with Sweden and Finland, that being a foolish idea that would threaten. It was kind of hubris the then. We didn't think there was really an opponent anymore. And we actually offered aid to Russia in the process. Yeah. I think. And we invited them. That's a little similar to the formal offer of the Marshall Plan to Russia, which was made initially as well. And Washington was very happy they didn't take it. But, and again, they didn't take it when under, I guess it was Clinton, they offered aid to Russia to reconstruct and rebuild, which they desperately needed at the time. They were in terrible economic condition after the fall of the Cold War. Um, but, you know, we, we, we disassociated that from what it means strategically in their thinking or, or, or um, you know, what it means to their concept of who they are that they would lose Ukraine, that they would lose these places that they considered integral and that people had grown up in, like the Baltic states. Russians had grown up there too. So um, there's a a kind of a a glossing over of kind of identity politics that leads to wars, unfortunately. There's actually two questions from Dr. Richard Denton. The first is he's hoping the panelists, and this is directed towards uh, Dr. Pearson, could talk about the use of bombing with conventional missiles of nuclear power plants. And the second question is, what are the chances of negotiations with the lack of trust between all the sides? And will Zelensky agree to Minsk too? Thank you. All those are tremendously difficult problems. Uh, certainly. And, and again, we note that in the theories of when negotiations work, Zartman's work, William Zartman, it's when there's a mutually hurting stalemate. And unfortunately, I don't think the Russians are hurting sufficiently. Uh, the, the Ukrainians probably are uh, losing 200 troops a day, if that's an accurate figure. Um, but how long can they sustain that? Uh, but the Russians are not at the point of a mutual um, stalemate in their thinking, probably. When the more that can be done to promote that, the better. Um, but it makes it makes negotiation at this point very difficult and, uh, and untrusting. Uh, whether Zelensky could trust or whether the, uh, you know, anybody could trust the results of a negotiation with Moscow, uh, which involved significant troop pullout, let's say. 
which would be on the table for the Ukrainians to need significant Russian troop withdrawal. Um, and in a way, you know, the Russians had a smart thing going bad as it was where they could infiltrate Eastern Ukraine without sending their for, full army in uh, during those days from 2014 onward, but they overplayed it. And I think possibly based on the potential that they saw for NATO, um, NATO expansion and um, some of the things that weren't going their way, uh, the Minsk, uh, 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 you know, the Minsk uh, uh, failure. So they want it their way, but they don't want to overspend if they can get if they can get away with it. These sanctions, most people are saying, are not being effective yet, if if at all, partly because of the gas exports that they're able to sustain in Russia. Um, and I don't know that that economic sanctions ever really work when it's a significant strategic uh, question that people would sacrifice uh, to to uh, achieve their goals. So it becomes a very difficult one. And bombing, uh, bombing nuclear plants, as Dr. Saperstein could attest, is very, is very problematic. Of, uh, you know, we all remember Chernobyl, which wasn't bombed, but had a tremendous impact on the fallout in Europe. And that would be the case of tactical nuclear weapons, too. The kind of uh, radiation effects, fallout effects, um, are mm. not really well, uh, well understood by a lot of people, I think. Uh, do, does anybody really believe that they would do something as stupid as bombing a, a reactor? I doubt that. I mean, anybody would know better than that, because that would not just be a local thing. That would be 10 times worse than Chernobyl. And God knows, you know, that's even... Well, they expanded. did attack one earlier, didn't they? But yeah. they, they, you know, they would do stupid things that would make a mistake, like put, accidentally shoot at at a weakened place that, you know, those things are not really hardened. You A, a, a good well-placed bullet probably can penetrate. Uh, but also if you turn, if you interrupt the flow of water so they can't keep the, uh, the stuff cool, then you have a meltdown and that could happen. But they, they did do stuff like that. So I think it's more likely to be not an intended uh, bombing of a, a reactor as so much as a, uh, a, a, you know, stupid mistake of some kind. But, you know, uh, uh, maybe uh, Al Saperstein can, uh, it can uh, weigh in on this question. Well, <clears throat> I don't know enough about the Ukrainian nuclear reactors. I suspect that they're built uh, with the, uh, without the concrete shells that Western nuclear reactors have. Certainly Chernobyl did not have that. But I'm told that the newer ones are better protected. Um, but in any case, um, attacking a nuclear plant uh, is self-defeating. Let's put it that way. Uh, destroying a nuclear plant in Ukraine uh, is the... Let me put it another way. We were talking about what is necessary to have negotiations. If only one party is suffering, there's no need for negotiations. The only reason you're going to have negotiations if both parties are suffering. Right now, the Russians are not suffering. The only way to get no, uh, uh, negotiations going is if somehow or other the Russians start to suffer like the Ukrainians are suffering. Now, one way of doing that, of course, is to destroy some nuclear reactors close to the R Russian border. Uh, another way, as far as I can tell, uh, is if somehow or other the West uh, supplies Ukraine with long distance missiles, not necessarily nuclear missiles, but the fact remains that the Russians are able to send uh, non-nuclear missiles to various Ukrainian cities and wreck damage all over the place. And the average Russian citizen says, what war? There's no war. Uh, until the Ukrainians can do significant damage to Russian cities, the Russians have no, no need to negotiate. I totally agree. As long as the Russians think they're winning, they're not heading to, towards the negotiating table. Um, so I, I think Fred's right. Unless it's a mutually destructive stalemate, um, we're not going to get there. Um, but to Al's point, you know, I, I think at least, yeah, I can't speak for the White House, but 
it seems that on the U.S. side, we are very hesitant to provide the Ukrainians with weapon systems that will allow them to strike into Russia. Mm-hmm. That that could then start moving this towards the use of a tactical nuclear weapon. Um, so we're we're very carefully metering what weapon systems we provide to Ukraine, not to provide by Putin with some excuse to escalate. And, you know, the the problem with dealing with Russia, too, is their nuclear policy of escalating to de-escalate, where they would take a step that we would never consider, like the use of a tactical nuclear weapon. Um, and then that in itself uh, brings the all the negotiating parties to the table or or causes us to back off. They're willing to do things that we are not willing to do. And that makes them a dangerous um, foe in in a situation like that. And I'm not sure that our our doctrines, our military doctrines are similar. I I don't know enough about Russian military thinking, but it seems to me that they may not have the same firewall mentality between going conventional and going nuclear that they may see it all as a continuum, at least at the tactical they, they do. I mean, their exercises, they go from tactical to operational to nuclear uh, in their exercises. We do not do that. We have a firewall there. And let's remember how they started with their nuclear missile, with their missile program back in the 50s when they began their full development. They put that in the artillery corps. The rocket corps, as it was called, was in the artillery of the army. It wasn't a separate um, strategic force or you know, deployment. It was part of the artillery because that's how they always operated, and they still do. Artillery is the key to their whole military approach. They just bombard you with these, uh, these katushas and all of these things that destroy these cities and did it in Aleppo. They've done it in... in, uh, in, in, in um, Chechnya, and they're clearly doing it in Ukraine. Uh, destroy to take. And so where does nuclear, where does tactical come in there? Is it totally separate? Not necessarily, you know, it's part of destroying. And we let me remind aware. Fred, let me remind you, Fred, that we put nuclear weapons in our artillery also. Yeah, but not, we also had we, a separate, we, uh, we, we they had- were part of the, They were part of the army. The Army had 155 millimeter. Right, but guns. eventually it became the Air Force, right? No, I'm talking about artillery from I'm talking about nuclear artillery. Yeah, I'm talking about missiles. Missiles when they set up when they set up the missiles in Cuba, it wasn't the Air Force that set them up. It was the it was the field artillery that set them up because oh, that's that where they be, always had them. That may be, but we're talking about artillery and and you gotta keep in mind that we had nuclear artillery. Right. Whether we right. still do, I don't know. True. That's true. But we did have it. In fact, we had we had nuclear bombs so small that the, there was a one man sort of a bazooka like like thing, which. Uh, no, I didn't mean to gloss. Oh, yeah, you're right, Al. Uh, you, you make it sound like it's past tense. You're saying they don't anymore. Is that right? Alan? I didn't say that. No, I, I don't know whether we still have that or not. Mm-hmm. I maybe, bet we do. Maybe John Manson knows. Do you know, John? As far as I know, we don't have cannon fired. But we have you, uh, the United States any longer. But there are uh, approximately 100, perhaps 120 forward based tactical nuclear weapons on five you know, countries bases. Uh, and in fact, I think it was yesterday, one of the bases in Belgium, they discovered a drug making uh, factory equipment for ecstasy. So people in in Belgium are concerned about that. But I wanted to just mention this theory about, I call it the right for resolution theory, the idea that both sides have to be ready to negotiate. We keep talking about Russia, but maybe um, Europe will be ready to negotiate in the fall because of the gas imports uh, declining. And as the winter approaches, that maybe pressure will be put on Zelensky by countries like Germany that are very dependent on gas. And so, you know, we're looking at, I think we should look back at ourselves and say, will we be willing to have a frozen conflict 
with perhaps Donbass and Luhansk belonging to uh, Russia and having a new central front that uh, would be in Europe. And into, in my mind, I see that as a safer freeze than to continue a proxy war like this all next winter. I'm not sure, I mean, I'm not saying we should give up. I'm just saying the num 500 Ukrainians a day is a lot to, to lose. And we don't know how many Russians are going back and sink coffins to their moms. But there's gonna be pressure on uh, Russians, but not enough to go to the table. Maybe we should start talking about going to the table this fall. And it also depends on how the U.S. does or doesn't gear up its liquefied natural gas exports to levels. Well, we're talking about that in Canada, but we're not levels that could about sustain it. Germany. Let's say or not. We need, yeah, we're not deliberately talking about that, and that concerns me. We would have to start talking about that, and also the food situation and the shortages for everywhere, like Libya and Yemen and so on, where they're going to go through mass starvation and not enough sunflower oil. So the crisis right now is not right for resolution, but it certainly will be by the fall. And that's when maybe we should start thinking about putting some pressure on Ukrainians to recognize that the dividing line is going to be there and uh, NATO will be not taking Ukraine as a member, obviously, but not for a long time. But maybe that would be safer for the world rather than to continue on like this. But the idea. EU is flirting with their membership, right? Wow. Yeah, the EU has said they would accept Ukraine, which is interesting. Um, and well, they can't right away, but but I think symbolically it's quite interesting because they're almost completely unanimous in saying, sure, come on in eventually. And that probably has to really get under Putin's skin. Can I bring up a, a historical an analogy to the Putin-Ukraine situation? Sure. I can't help but thinking back to the Sudetenland in, uh, in where was it, 1936 or 37, somewhere around there, when uh, the same argument was used by Hitler. In other right. words, the Czechs were badly cheating, cheating the Germans in, the, in, in, the Czech, in, the Czech, in Czechoslovakia at that time. The, the Czechs were supposedly badly cheating, treating the German-speaking people. And all he was going to do was taking over the, the German-speaking areas. And uh, people like uh, um, Chamberlain said, OK, we're not going to do anything about it. And of course, uh, once, he, once he had taken the Sudetenland, and we went on to take the rest of the Czechoslovakia, which again, we said nothing about. And of course, that led to, as far as I can see, uh, I don't remember whether Austria came first or, or second. Uh, and then we came to Poland and, of course, all of World War II. So uh, the analogies between Hitler and Sudetenland and uh, Putin and the eastern parts of the Ukrainian are striking to me. And uh, I, really, I really worry about saying, all right, let's settle this by giving Putin um, eastern Ukraine. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think um, his mother Russia will accept that. I, I think the difference now, though, I agree with Al and, and the general analogy, is that, you know, we are more tentative in how we deal with Putin because of his nuclear arsenal. So, you know, that's why we don't have our forces fighting in Ukraine on behalf of Ukrainian sovereignty. Um, as I said before, there's some, some line uh, that we're not willing to cross. Uh, that could cause escalation to a nuclear conflict. And we're just not willing to do Ukraine. I just get tired of this analogy. We had it with Afghanistan, Al. We continue always to have the Chamberlain analogy and the Sudetenland and so on. But the fact of the matter is the Russians, they are part of the Baltic countries. There's lots of Russians in eastern Ukraine and so on. There's tons of Russians everywhere. And in the long run, three generations from now, they'll all start talking to each other and they'll all start trading and it will all, it will all be over. But if we keep sending million, billions of dollars of armaments into Ukraine, that stuff is all going to be reused. It's all going to be resold. It's going to be a huge problem for the world for generations to come. So I'm more into, I, I really think you cannot make the argument that, um, uh, 
Russia, because they did not win and they did not take Kiev, they did not take Kiev, and they're stuck in one small in one small part of Ukraine. Then that means that uh, Putin is another Hitler, and we need to say no to any kind of expansion. No, he's losing in the world international community. He is losing. He's a pariah state. I would not want to be him with his daughters. <laughs> I'm not too worried about that, uh, him being another Hitler. We all. I, I, I think Fred brought this up. You know, sanctions on Russia right now. That that's a, a difficult uh, regime to keep in place. Uh, sanctions regime. Uh, the Russians are 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 actually doing quite well. He's selling oil, making a huge amount of money that he's using to fund this war. Uh, The Chinese have provided a safety valve. There are several large nations, including India, that refuse them. And, you know, you just brought it up yourself, the um, uh, Erica, you know, as the winter comes, Putin's hand will be strengthened. Um, You know, the Europeans are going to need that oil to stay warm this winter. So you know, if I were Putin, if I were really playing the devil's advocate, I'd say, let's keep grinding away in Eastern Ukraine. Let's keep moving towards victory, whatever that might be. And you boys hold on because when the winter comes, the advantage is going to be much more in our favor strategically. But I think we think he's a pariah. Um, but he's not alone out there in the world. There are, there are several states that we don't consider are still they're, they're not friends or allies of, of the West that are not condemning Russia. Yeah, we saw that. Okay, happen. there are the, several, the UN General Assembly vote. We saw that. There are when several they, when 35 countries. Are, yeah, 35 countries abstained, and yeah, those are the countries I'm, that we should be pressuring, including like Sudan. And China and India and the, and the Western Alliance should be pressuring them to uh, take stronger steps against Russia. Obviously, that's that's very important. Some states that are friends of the West that are also abstaining, like Israel. Yeah, Israel is abstaining because it wants to show that it could negotiate between both sides, just like Turkey. Actually, I more I think, over eyes and, I think it's quite it's a little bit different than that, Erica. I think that they want to maintain closer ties to Russia because of Syria. When they intervene in yeah. Syria, they, they don't want any Russian interference, and the Russians are uh, dealing with them about that. Also, peace activists, about half or more of the um, emails that I get from listservs are from people who say, uh, really, it's the U.S.'s fault. This whole war wouldn't have happened if it hadn't been for the U.S. And they're really nice people who think that way. So I'm always very surprised because they say, you know, if we hadn't expanded NATO, uh, uh, Putin wouldn't have uh, felt so nervous. He wouldn't have done it. Well, I don't think that's true. It was, you have a good uh, uh, argument to that effect. But on the other hand, uh, although I I think it was a mistake for them to expand, but I don't think it's really his motive. I think his motive was, became very clear a couple of weeks ago when he started talking about how he was the second, uh, he was channeling uh, Peter the Great. Yes. And and so he, it was up to Peter the Great to, uh, create this wonderful Russian empire. And so it's now up to him to cre- recreate the Russian empire. And we all ha- have to hang together and, and, uh, and, and make sure that we get this uh, Slavic uh, empire put back together. Make well, that's his motive again. all along. And, he, and it showed up already when he was attacking uh, Abkhazia and you know, South Ossetia and, uh, you know, all of these other places. Georgia. Georgia, exactly. Yeah. So that you can't blame that but you, on NATO. But the triggering for that, Meta, you can't ignore the fact, though, that the triggering for the timing was that Georgia was being talked about to enter NATO and Ukraine was being talked about to enter NATO as early as 2008. And that kicked it over for him, I think. I think so, really. Those were both mistaken kinds of openings that the Bush administration started with. I think that they thought they could just, you know, have their way. Um, well, whether uh, NATO was 
did, I mean, you just raised it, Fred, that the um, under the Obama administration, it was mistaken to perhaps dangle NATO membership out to Georgia and also maybe to Ukraine. And I'm wondering- It started in 07 with the Bush administration. Yeah, that's what you're saying, in 2007. But do you think most recently that maybe NATO made a mistake and should have been more clear that Ukraine was not going to be part of NATO? I think they tried to make that I just want to know what John thinks about it, if you don't mind, if you can talk. Um, No, do I think it was a mistake? No, I think in 2008, it was well-intentioned. you know, there were risks, there's a security dilemma, um, you know, as we all, we all talk about. Uh, they misjudged Putin's reaction and the possible uh, resurgence of Russia as a great power at the time. But it was a series of steps. This was salami slicing um, that, that led eventually to Putin carrying out these actions. I think there's a direct tie, as Fred said, between 2007 and very shortly after uh, uh, Putin invading uh, Georgia. Uh, there's a similar tie to Ukraine. You know, you got to stand in his shoes and see how this was all uh, all carried out. You know, but it, you know, whether you say it was a mistake or not, it I think depends on whether you really believe in Western values and the Washington Treaty and all these democracies have to stick together. And if somebody wants to be in the club, we bring in as like a purist principle, or do you believe in the real politic side um, uh, and, and you exclude some democracy because we're worried about defending them. Uh, and, and both sides are right in a certain, certain context. But, uh, John, if you're going to be uh objective about NATO and its whole existence, it's not in democracy, it's geography. Why else did they take Turkey into NATO? Come on. The reason for NATO's map has always been the containment notion um, that you referred to with Kennan. He meant it only for Europe, by the way. And so that's how they tried to implement it. So yes, democracy is a nice cover, but uh, Georgia is a democracy. Ukraine is a democracy in those days. Uh Uh-uh. They were highly corrupt. They were very uh, authoritarian in their orientations. Uh, The reason is geography, and that's how it's viewed in Russia, and probably rightly so. And Sweden and Finland, Sweden and Finland are more geography. (laughs) They're adding how many more miles to the border? 800 more miles, is it, I, I think? Yeah, I mean, I, I, there's a strong argument in favor of what Fred is saying, but it's a mix. It's a mix of, you know, democratic values and the rules-based international order and uh, geography and real politique and, and, and um, you know, great power uh, competition. It's also fear. I mean, you know, you talked before about Poland. Poland may not be the greatest democracy, but they're terrified of the Russians and we're super anxious to get in the NATO and they are great allies. They, you know, will defend NATO territory, you know, as the sec gen said, you know, every inch of NATO territory. Um, Sweden and Finland, you know, this giant flip with Finland in particular is because of the fear of, of Russia. Um, I mean, hell, this is like reading Thucydides and the fear of Athens in Sparta. This is what nation states have done for 2000 years. Um, hey, I, I got to go. I got a meeting and I got to jump in a car and, and head out. Uh, time to stop anyway. So uh, thank you all. It's been fascinating. I, I would love to th- say that we had uh, a meeting of minds and now uh, uh, have a clear idea of what we need to do, but I'm afraid not. So uh, to be continued in some form or other. Thanks so much, guys. Thanks, everybody. And, and Eric, I appreciate your help. Bye. Project Save the World produces one of these shows three days a week, and sometimes more. This is episode number 469. You can watch them or listen to them as audio podcasts on our website, tosavetheworld.ca. Eventually, we even post the transcripts there. When you get there, look around. We have conversations going on there all the time about six global issues, plus potential reforms in governance, economics, and civil society. 
To find a particular talk show, enter its title or episode number in the search bar or the number, uh, the name of one of the guest speakers. And after you've watched or listened, scroll down and share your own thoughts about the show. This is a place for dialogue. Project Save the World also produces a quarterly online publication, Peace Magazine. You can buy a single copy or subscribe for $20 Canadian per year through PressReader. Just go to pressreader.com on your browser and in the search bar, enter the word peace. You'll see the cover of the current issue and buttons to click to subscribe.